The phenomenon of technology, liberation or alienation of man, by Matilda Niel. Matilda Niel has in recent years devoted herself to the critique of the mores and social institutions of alienated society. In connection with this research, she has lectured regularly at the Sorbonne and has published numerous papers, among which are the humanistic psychoanalysis analysts, the humanistic psychoanalysis of Eric Fromm, the failure of love, microphysical and metaphysical ebb, and Boris Pasternak in search of an overt humanism. Born in 1915, she had to interrupt her higher studies because of her activity in the French resistance movement during World War II. In collaboration with André Niel, she resumed her research after the war and analyzed the process of creative conscience and alienated conscience. The problem I intend to discuss is certainly the most serious which confronts modern man. What is to become of the individual in a technological civilization? After a period of crisis, are we going to be turned into automatized robots? Or finally liberated? No one doubts that the phenomenon of technology dominates our age. Up to the 19th century, techniques evolved very slowly. Their transformation was hardly perceptible in the course of an individual's life. At present, technological development is accelerated and invades not only working life, but also family life and leisure time. War and peace depend upon it. It transforms our natural surroundings and our living condition. Moreover, it takes hold of our very souls. Present techniques, such as advertising and propaganda, manipulate and condition the human mind. There are those who rejoice at this influence of technology upon the life of the individual. They expect human salvation to follow technological progress. Others are alarmed and see in this progress the final enslavement of mankind. Whom shall we believe? Is technology a factor of alienation or of liberation of the individual? Is it a humanizing or a dehumanizing influence? This, in its simplest form, is the question I shall try to answer. Liberated Man and Alienated Man <laughs> What exactly is to be understood by liberated man and alienated man? One might say that the liberated man is the generous and disinterested man. He is also a creative man who can express his personality and his talents in a creative action without constraint, whether in manual, intellectual, or artistic work, or in his relations and friendship with other men. The free man is one who feels himself at the same time fully himself and in accord with other men. He is an individual without idols, dogmas, prejudices, or a priori ideas. He is tolerant, inspired by a profound sense of justice and equality, and aware of himself as being at the same time an individual, and a universal man. The alienated man, on the contrary, never succeeds either in being himself or in living in a state of creative synthesis with other beings or things. He does not live in the present, whose wealth he fails to appreciate. He is interested only in the future, which draws him in a quest, which draws him in quest of some kind of absolute or in his desire to conform with a model or ideal the alienated man does not think or act by himself 
he always refers to something or someone outside himself. To tradition, a creed, an ideology, a transcendent being, or a superior. He does not know how to live either in a dialogue with others or in an interior peace. He always needs someone to worship or to serve, to hate or to fight. He spends his life in pursuing something, either a material end, which has been turned into an absolute desire for wealth, comfort, the symbols of prestige, or a spiritual end, also turned into an absolute, which leads him to disdain life and the world. Sometimes he believes he has attained this absolute good, and then he is joyful and exalted. At other times he feels frustrated, then he is miserable and depressed. His life is passed in desiring, hoping, despairing, worshipping, and despising. The alienated man is tense, embattled, violent. He is narrow, intolerant, and authoritarian. He is the passionate man. But he is also the pusillanimous, pusillanimous man who fears authority, who is afraid of not thinking and acting like everyone else. He is cowardly, timorous, conformist, the gregarious man. The liberated man, generous and creative, is not utopian, nor is he an abstract model to follow. The liberated man is an is in us. The liberated man is in us. Without this creative man, there would never have been any sciences, any art, any acts of solidarity, any tolerance or social progress. There would never have been any close-knit families or faithful friends. But we have to admit, unfortunately, that in the individual, as in society, the forces of liberation have always encountered the forces the forces of liberation have always encountered the forces of alienation, and that the forces of alienation have usually triumphed. At the present time, the forces of dehumanization are so strong that the individual and the whole human species are in danger. But at the same time, the number of people who are becoming educated, who read good books and listen to good records, is increasing, and human solidarity is growing. Alongside contempt for man, there is respect for man. We have to consider whether the development of technology will be undertaken with respect for man or with contempt for man. Technology as a factor of humanization. It cannot be denied that the development of technology has made possible an improvement in the standard of living of great numbers of men, the relief of much physical suffering, the liberation of man from unpleasant tasks, and the prolongation of human life. A man who is hungry, cold, or in pain cannot be himself. From this point of view, then, technology has been a liberator. Many economists claim that technology awakens intelligence and stimulates initiative and creativity. This is the view of the French economist Georges Florasti and Louis Armand. They believe that the modern world demands creative minds capable of inventing and improving machines and organizations. In order to handle and repair the growing number of delicate and complex machines, workers are needed who have already intelligence and who are expert in their own special field. Quote, 
the ideal limit toward which the new organization of labor is tending is one where work will be limited to a single type of action, initiative, end quote, writes Foresti. These economists even consider that workers will be transferred increasingly from the agricultural sector and the tech and technologically advanced industrial sector of the economy, the primary and secondary sectors, to the tertiary sectors and of more individualized services. For example, automation will require few workers and technicians, while the demand for hairdressers, laundry workers, painters, repairers, dentists, doctors, teachers, bank and insurance clerks, and civil servants will increase. Because the demand for consumer goods cannot grow indefinitely, a point of saturation will soon be reached, and people will demand relatively less in the way of foodstuffs and domestic appliances, and more in the way of such objects as paintings, records, furniture, and works of art. Thanks to the nature of work in the tertiary sector, and to the universal spread of culture, man will be able to develop completely as an individual. At least, this is what this future seems to promise. Moreover, the development of technology should permit a considerable reduction in working hours and an extension of leisure time, in which each individual can exercise his preferred activity whether it is pottering about the house, gardening, painting, reading, or listening to music. The cultural use of leisure is certainly aided by the growing diffusion of good records and books at low prices. But above all, technology should contribute to making social relations more amicable and lead towards social justice and equality. Comfort is being democratized. Clothes and dwellings are becoming more alike. Rich and poor use the same roads, go to the same places on vacations, read the same papers, see the same television programs. Thanks to the spread of trans uh, thanks to the speed of transportation, the same foods are becoming available to everyone. Customers are increasingly homogenous. One might even argue that the worker is becoming bourgeois, while the bourgeois is becoming more democratic, and that the social classes are losing their ritualistic character. Some believe that, as a result of technological development, capitalism will expire of its own accord. It has been observed that when a country begins to industrialize, the barriers between classes break down. Nehru has said that the caste system becomes impossible in a train or on a factory conveyor belt. Since work is now carried on by teams, in factories and laboratories, scientific discoveries and technical inventions result very often from a creative cooperation with demands from each member of the team, a disinterested attitude and a spirit of give and take. Finally, the modern techniques of transmitting information allow individuals to take an interest in men and events throughout the whole world. Science, television, literature, music, and film cross national frontiers, which tend to be increasingly unimportant. Louis Armand considers that in a technological civilization, quote, International cooperation becomes more and more imperative, end quote. And that, quote, everything urges us towards sharing on a planetary scale, end quote. In other words, a world civilization in which individuals, feeling their unity, and no longer hounded by need or crushed by work, could become autonomous and creative. This is the wonderful prospect which technology offers. However, we need only look around us to see that we are still far from this golden age. What, in fact, does a technological civilization offer us in the mid-20th century? Sprawling towns in which the air is polluted, 
vast business enterprises and impersonal government departments. A press and radio that exploit the lowest human sentiments and the most vulgar taste of the public. And colossal sums of money spent in preparing the most monstrous kind of war. Everywhere, anguish and increasing mental illness. And the general retreat of democracy in the face of totalitarianism and dictatorship. It is this hostile and menacing face which our technological universe presents. We have the right to ask, then, why it is that technology, which could liberate the individual and break down barriers in the world, contributes, on the contrary, to the alienation of man. Technology as a factor in alienation. Ever since the 18th century, but especially in the 19th and 20th centuries, Scientific and technical discoveries have provoked a decline of the old religious, moral, and social values. In the words of Jacques Ellul, they have eliminated the sacred from the world. Unfortunately, man has made technology sacred. Instead of being treated as a means to make life more human, it has become an end in itself. The objects created by technology, whose workings are not understood by most consumers, have become mysterious, the objects of a new cult. The occupation of a technician has a quasi-religious attraction. Like the priests of the ancient civilizations, the technocrats, physicists, engineers, and economists constitute a ruling class which dominates the ignorant masses by its mysterious knowledge, its power, and its high rewards. The development of technology has given rise to a new morality. Useful research, submission to the needs of production and output, concern with quantity and efficiency have become the virtues of the new morality, the technological morality. On the other hand, disinterested research, art, poetry, philosophical thought, etc. have become new mortal sins. Professor Rubal of the Faculty of the Sciences at the University of Nancy, or Nancy, uh, for some reason I won't feel, like it's, <laughs> feel like it's pronounced Nancy if it's French, but I don't know. Uh, boast of feeling a real contempt for the human sciences. What is needed above all, he writes, are genuine mathematicians, physicists, chemists, biologists, and geologists, and nothing else. All the rest is only dangerous and sterile polliver. End quote. As Jacques Ellul has shown very well, the technological totalitarianism which already exercises such a strong religious and moral influence is insinuating itself into our family life, leisure, and education. Technological totalitarianism dominates political life itself and threatens the liberty of the citizen. Propaganda, even in the democratic countries, makes abundant use of radio, television, and the press and increasingly conditions the electorate. Moreover, the police employ more and more advanced techniques for discovering opponents of the regime. By being placed in the service of the state and of ideologies, technology has become even more threatening. The combination of technology-state ideology constitutes a super-absolute, which aims to dominate the world and eliminate its opponents. It is in the name of this collective super-absolute, raised to a tyrannical god and disregarding the profound needs of individuals, that the state formulates its plans for expansion. Like other religions, technology promises a paradise for the individual, a paradise which is no longer in heaven but on earth, in the future. 
quote, let us take an interest in the future rather than the present, end quote, Louis Armand proposes. Later on, we shall at last attain the golden age of the, quote, tertiary civiliz civilization, end quote, of which Ferrasti dreams, or the communist paradise of which Marxist materialism dreams. In the meantime, men alienated by the new religion must be patient bear their sufferings, and actively prepare their own virtual destruction. In order to help resign the alienated masses to the failure of the golden age, an immediately tangible form of happiness is promised, that which is acquired by possession of the material goods which technology produces. The acquisition of a new car, a new gadget, a new object has become the religion, the goal of life of the majority of individuals in the rich nations. Sustained by advertising, the modern cult of novelty allows the individual to escape, through his desires, from a meaningless present. Once granted that technological man cannot find a means of expressing himself in the abstract, bureaucratic, mechanized, and subdivided work of large factories and offices, the attraction of an object to be acquired, and the mystical conviction that its acquisition will bring happiness gives a semblance of purpose to his working day. In the words of G. Friedman, quote, the individual, unsatisfied as a producer, tries to find satisfaction as a consumer, end quote. There is another cult which has also been engendered by the conditions of work in a technological civilization. Leisure, which is opposed to work, has become an object of worship. Quote, the real life of many workers can only be lived in leisure time, end quote, Friedman writes. But how can a man who is alienated in his work rediscover himself in his leisure time? He does not know how to live in the present, to meditate, or to create. For those few who spend their leisure in reading, in educating themselves, in pursuing a hobby, how many are there who are simply bored and kill time in passive distractions which reinforce the alienation created by work? In France, the land of culture, 58% of individuals never open a book and the majority of the rest only read one or two books a year, for the most part detective stories and digests. When he returns home in the evening, often after a long journey in an overcrowded train, the worker or clerk finds himself confronted with numerous chores, including the form-filling tasks which are multiplied by our bureaucratic society. But when he is finally free of his work, and his social obligations. The individual is supposed to pass swiftly from a condition of alienation to one of creativity, from passivity to free activity. Many are incapable of this metamorphosis. For them, alienating leisure follows alienating work. If only it were the case that in this abdication of his individuality, modern man found at least a kind of happiness and relaxation. But it is not so. On the contrary, technological man lives in a state of extreme psychological tension. For many manual workers, work and reward are tied to the clock. Production is based upon a competitive system. Advertising creates a constant state of desire, and thus of tension, and the rivalry between individuals is carried to the limits of, quote, competitive display of purchasing power, end quote. The state of tension is accompanied by anxiety and is the cause of many psychosomatic illnesses. Not knowing how to employ his energies except in a life of excitement and tension, 
Modern man no longer knows how to live in a state of relaxation. And so, by way of compensation, he searches passionately in his leisure time for this state of relaxation, which he no longer experiences and which he identifies with happiness itself. Relaxation has become one of the absolutes to which modern man aspires most strongly. But genuine relaxation cannot be an object of desire. Genuine relaxation comes from living in a permanent condition of self-control and equilibrium, in working hours, in family life, and in leisure time. When relaxation becomes something exceptional, an ideal end, it becomes a new cause of tension. On the occasions when technological man could experience it, the espe especially during leisure time and on his vacation, he is bored and worried. In order to get rid of his boredom and anxiety, he flees from them into new tension-producing activities. He frequents places where life is noisy and hectic, goes to the movies, reads magazines, drives his car, or wanders around the shops where his desire to purchase is excited. In other words, he plunges into useless activities and creates an illusion that his life is full and active. But the illusion of activity is not the only one which sustains technological man. We have seen the technology confusing adaptation and creation gives individuals the illusion that they are creative. Only a minority, which G. Friedman estimates at 10% of the personnel of an enterprise, is engaged in work which requires initiative. These are the supervisors and the technicians of the planning office. The rest, 90%, are, quote, confined to the execution of specialized and subdivided tasks which are totally lacking in interest. End quote. Those who are aware of the illusions cherished by our technological civilization are harassed by doubt and indecision. What is to be done? Is it better to keep one's individuality, to exercise initiative, to be free and creative, and in consequence to live in relative poverty and without prestige? Or, on the contrary, to keep in step? to amass wealth, to succeed, by adapting oneself to the technological world, to reject social success, alienating work, and stupefying distractions, is to become an outlaw, to be cut off from one's milieu, to be alone. But every normal human being has a need to be himself, and at the same time to be connected with his milieu, the feeling of isolation is a cause of profound suffering, and it needs exceptional courage and a solid, solidly based humanist faith. And it needs exceptional courage and a solidly based humanist faith to be able to live in opposition to industrial society. That is why so many abdicate and, in order to find security, live like everyone else, and become resigned to their alienation. There can be no doubt that the personality and the equilibrium of the individual are gravely threatened by technological civilization. Must we conclude that the only solution is to return to the life of pre-industrial society? But such a return presupposes that these societies produced a relatively happy and free humanity. And history with its record of individual misery, of religious, civil, and foreign wars, shows us that this is not so. Those who make technology directly responsible for the alienation of modern man forget that man has always been more or less alienated, that he has never been the autonomous individual in harmony with the world that he ought to be. A humanity composed of free men, related creatively to each other and to the world, has still to be achieved. 
The development of technology gives a special cast to alienation in the present, but technology is not directly responsible for it. In truth, technological man is not, as is often supposed, a new species, regarded as superior by some, and as inferior by others. In actuality, man, who conceived this technology, has remained the same as he was before. Today is yesterday. Man passes the greater part of his life in pursuing illusory absolutes, dreams of paradise, prestige, and power, in worshipping idols and leaders, in venerating some men and despising others, in loving only to hate afterward, in escaping from real freedom and its risks, as Eric Fromm has shown, in order to find the warm security of conforming with the fur ways of conforming with the ways of the herd. Certainly, technology has freed many workers from exhausting tasks and has lightened their sufferings, but their souls have remained enslaved. Technology has not, therefore, quote, depersonalized man. It has only made his alienation more blatant. Technology is neither a beneficent divinity nor a maleficent, maleficent fiend. Technology is neither a beneficent divinity nor a malefic, maleficent fiend. It is not an absolute to worship or an anti-absolute to fight. Such absolutism is the cause of all fanaticism, including technological fanaticism. Actual existing man has always been ready, through ignorance, to sacrifice himself and to suffer for future man, and to live in the illusion of a celestial or terrestrial paradise. Terrestrial paradise. Technology has become today the new support for this old absolutist and emotional mentality. Thus, instead of being the means of liberation which it could be, technology has become a new means of enslavement. Technology would be harmless or even beneficial if used by men liberated from their passions. But used by alienated men, it threatens the existence of the individual, of civilization, and of the human race itself. The real problem is to know whether the possibilities of liberty, creativity, and generosity, which are dormant in everyone, will one day be able to express themselves fully, and whether man can finally become himself. The fundamental problem of man is therefore independent of the problem of technology. It is necessary, as Jacques Ellul has observed, to demystify technology and to stop worshipping technology as a divinity. But this is not enough. Man himself must be freed from alienation. As we saw at the beginning of this study, technology is not simply the expression of an alienated consciousness. It is also the expression of a free and creative consciousness which exists in a more or less stifled way alongside the alienated consciousness. The desire to provide a decent material existence for all, to free men from tedious and exhausting jobs, to prolong human life, to create new objects, all these are sensible aspirations. If technology becomes a means instead of an end, if it served existing man, it would promote a harmonious synthesis between individuals and their milieu, would become human again, and would create a human universe. Quote, if respect for man is established in the hearts of men, wrote saint Expiré, quote, then men will eventually succeed in constructing a political, 
social, and economic system which consecrates this respect. End quote. What lesson should humanist socialism draw from the preceding analysis? In the first place, a genuinely human socialism could not limit its reforms to change in the economic system. It would have to reconsider the uses of technology. In fact, in all economic systems, machinery and technology tend to draw men into the path of alienation. The myth of record production, abstract relations of the individual to his work, creation of artificial needs, etc. A human socialism would strive to remove this alienated character in the use of technology, but still more, to free men completely from this alienation through an appropriate ethical code and through psychoanalysis. Similarly, a humanist socialism could not rely upon history to decide the fate of mankind. To act in accordance with the trend of history is to leave the way open for the forces of passion, individual or collective, to arouse new tensions and antagonisms, to accept the enslavement of the individual by technology, to believe that struggle and oppression will give birth, through some mysterious dialectic and by the sacrifice of millions of lives to free and creative individuals and a healthy society. But to speak frankly, machinery and technology have a natural tendency to enslave man and they are likely to become just as dangerous enemies as the most inhuman type of capitalism. The technological milieu is like a new system of cultivation introduced into a region which is suddenly attacked by a parasite which destroys the hopes of the farmers. Human alienation, like such a parasite, lust for power, egoism, avarice, social climbing, conformism, has found in the technological milieu, in all societies, a new means of sustenance and a particularly favorable field of expansion. It follows that humanist socialism cannot be limited to changing the property system, but must educate young people to develop freely their personal qualities and must seek to change the ancient pattern of human relationships. Once these relationships have become fraternal and productive, small and responsible collectivities, work groups, autonomy of the workers, there will be no need to fear the use of technology, for it will be controlled by reason, by friendship, by the rejection of alienation, by the need for a creative life and love of culture. Technology will then contribute to the prosperity of a fully human socialist system. Translated by T.B. Baltimore.